Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much, uh, George, for this opportunity to, uh, you know, sort of cross the pond without actually crossing it, so to speak. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to get into my talk and uh, the um, and we'll see where we go. So eight years ago, I wrote a paper uh, with a kind of similar theme and backdrop here. And strangely, of course, the, the basic uh, thesis, questions raised and responses suggested are perhaps even more necessary in our present cultural moment. Um, this paper uh, today will not particularly address the social context in which Wesley wrote his pamphlet uh, on genuine Christianity or how Wesley understood the other in his cultural moment there, except to say that I believe Wesley knew he was articulating a different perspective than the prevailing one of his day. Uh, even if there is uh, a legitimate critique regarding Methodist practice uh, then and up to the present day. So Wesley had this broad sense, as articulated in his writings, that all human beings, all societies, cultures, religious systems, were within the scope of God's gaze, embracing neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. Likewise, God was already at work within those cultures and many of the religious systems by natural revelation, prevenient grace. Given the increasing diversity of our globalizing social context, how does a Wesleyan lens inform our present ministry engagement? How does a distinctively Wesleyan theology and practice help us embrace the stranger in our culturally diverse communities? So those are my questions for today's talk. I'm going to pay particular attention to Wesley's uh, A Plain Account of Genuine Christianity as a background for this discussion, uh, seeking to discern a Wesleyan response to the stranger. And so in Wesley's uh, initially a letter uh, that a few years later was reprinted as a tract or pamphlet, a plain account, account of genuine Christianity. He takes great pains to assert that actual Christian faith and life, not only in apostolic and patristic, but also still in modern times, reflects the supernatural power of God and the miraculous presence of the Holy Spirit. So the great miracle of Christian living, that was what he was getting at, uh, is still present and active in the context of Christian community. Christian life and practice is the greatest apologetic for the faith. Can we articulate an inclusive and reconciled Christian community as miraculous evidence of the power of God in the midst of a culturally and religiously diverse society? And does a Wesleyan lens help us with this? Well, that lens must include a conversation about love. In making his case for who is a Christian indeed and what is real genuine Christianity, Wesley asserts that the genuine Christian is full of love to his neighbor. This is uh, universal love, not confined to one sect or party, not restrained to those who agree with him in opinions or in outward modes of worship, or to those who are allied to him by blood or recommended by nearness of place. Neither does he love those only that love him or that are endeared to him by intimacy of acquaintance. It soars above all these scanty bounds, embracing neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies, yea, not only the good and the gentle, but also the froward, the evil and the unthankful. For he loves every soul that God has made, every child of man of whatever place or nation. So two key phrases here for our purposes. Embracing neighbors and strangers, and amongst the many other qualifiers that Wesley lists here, those of whatever place or nation. Genuine Christian love, in Wesley's words, would embrace those like us as well as those with a different set of cultural and religious values, opinions, and practices. What's meant by embrace? Well, the simplest, clearest image is to open one's arms and grasp 
to hold another person close? Does it mean we accept their religious and cultural values, opinions, and practices? Maybe not, maybe some, but it certainly means we respect, value, listen to, and engage with the neighbor and the stranger as a fellow human being created in the image of God. In, uh, in Luke 10, the expert in the law asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus' response was a specific illustration of love expressed tangibly and interestingly for our purposes today across cultural barriers. In Wesley's thinking, love for one's neighbor, uh, says Manfred Marquardt, was characterized not only by its selflessness, but also by its absolute refusal to judge the person to whom it's given. Out of the relationship with God defined by love grew unlimited love for all humanity, even in the face of a neighbor's harboring hatred. In the context of Wesley's theological ethics, it's an untenable idea that national or racial differences, social positions as outsiders, or religious or philosophical differences make a person unworthy of love. Every person deserved love because he or she was loved by God. This leads us, of course, to the, the Wesleyan Arminian assertion that all are to be loved, even the stranger. And further, this is articulated as all are welcome to respond to God's call. Stuart Jordan adds, there is little point in the theoretical belief that all may come unless all are in practice made welcome. Pointing towards the, the context of Christian community where the Wesleyan picture of genuine Christianity is intended to become a reality. So Wesley made the, the test of true Christian living this generosity of spirit, this love for every human being that God had created. It's a generosity of spirit to the stranger, to the antagonistic, to the person from another nation. In our present social and cultural context, this genuine Christian love would embrace those like ourselves, as well as those with a different set of cultural and religious values, opinions, practices. And then Wesley's notion of salvation as healing has significance for this discussion. Um, Wesley viewed our sins as wounds wherewith the world, the flesh, and the devil have gashed and mangled us all over. They are diseases that drink up our blood and spirits that bring us down to the chambers of the grave. Pretty graphic language there. Uh, Wesley spoke of the present hope of salvation, uh, not just in the by and by, but in the real terms as a present deliverance from sin, a restoration of the soul to its primitive health, its original purity, a recovery of the divine nature, the renewal of our souls after the image of God in righteousness and true holiness. This implies all holy and heavenly tempers and by consequence, all holiness of conversation. Salvation as healing in the inner person is expressed as holy living in the outer world. Human beings, and by extension their societies, cultures, and environments, may be healed from the disease and the alienation of sin. In a Wesleyan worldview, the real possibility of healing human relations across ethnic and cultural barriers is a tangible result of Christ's sacrifice. Uh, Brian Stone here says that the practice of baptism forms us into a new story in which our previous stories are united to Christ through inclusion and reconciliation, rather than negation, evaporation, or homogenization. In Christ, Jew, Greek, male, female, slave, free, do not disappear, but are instead reconciled. And then Wesley connected engagement with the poor and the marginalized, the stranger, as a means of grace, as a practice necessary to full sanctification. In the scripture way of salvation, he particularly identified feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, entertaining the stranger, visiting those in prison or sick or variously afflicted, as actions which should be the natural outworking of repentance and renewal in Christ but which also serve as transformative grace encounters for uh, the person giving as well. 
So genuine Christianity in Wesley's view, among other things, includes both embracing and entertaining the stranger, offering genuine hospitality, as Oscar has pointed out, first out of a deep universal love, the same kind of love that's intended by love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself, but secondly, as a means of encountering the grace of God already at work in the other. In each encounter with otherness, it can be said that the people of God encounter God as other, and so rediscovers its own essential dependence upon God. The Wesleyan movement was birthed around the, the notion of gathering together for mutual encouragement, support, and accountability in the process of growth in grace. As Wesley put it, the gospel of Christ knows no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. He connects growth in grace with the outworking of that grace in community. Wesley added, I mean that it cannot subsist so well, but that it cannot subsist at all without society, without living and conversing with others. Uh, oh, yeah, there we are. Um, and then uh, Heinzenrader put it this way, Wesley's view of holiness, love of God, love of neighbor, neighbor works of piety, works of mercy, including the mean, uh, using the means of grace, becomes embodied in Methodism, which he views as the place where the church can experience the grace, presence, and power of God in ways that represent genuine Christianity in its organized form, the church. Thus, Methodism itself becomes a means of grace. In this apologia for genuine Christianity, Wesley says that it is God-filled, selfless love that produces gentleness, tenderness, humanity, courtesy, and affability towards one's neighbor. Love for one's neighbor is defined not just by personal selflessness, but also by its absolute refusal to judge the person to whom it's given, as Mark Hart said. Wesley understood the stranger as someone who was loved by God, but needed to be welcomed and healed uh, like all of us. And that somehow in engagement with those who are other than ourselves, the grace of God transforms us both in that encounter. And that all of this happens in the context of a community characterized by mutual encouragement and accountability. Wesley's view of Christian community in its various small and large group formats is of a gathering at the intersection between belief and unbelief, between godly and ungodly, between rich and poor, and we might add in our context between persons of different cultures and ethnicities, between dominant and minority cultures, a community that is in itself an apologetic to the world a means of grace. So uh, a Wesleyan way toward embracing the stranger. And this is, this is big picture stuff. There's a lot more sort of personal details of life in the context that I've done ministry over many years. But uh, so how do these brief reflections help us flesh out a Wesleyan way of embracing the stranger as the people of God in a culturally diverse neighborhood? Well, Canadian political philosopher Will Kimlishka navigates this discussion in our society here in Canada regarding the challenges of multicultural living. That space between the multicultural state and the intercultural citizen. The multicultural state creates institutions, charters, constitutions, and legal structures that fairly allow citizens who are the product of multiple cultures to live together with respect and civility. Ideally, these two levels should work together in any conception of citizenship. There should be a fit between our model of the multicultural state and our model of the intercultural citizen. So the sort of multicultural reforms we seek at the level of the state should help nurture and reinforce the desired forms of intercultural skills and knowledge at the level of individual citizens. Conversely, the intercultural dispositions we encourage within individual citizens 
should help support and reinforce the institutions of a multicultural state. So that's some basic multicultural social theory. But it's precisely this interface between the wider multicultural pluralistic society in which citizens live and the challenge of authentic engagement with one's different neighbor that causes alienation in our society. It's here that I believe Wesleyan theology and practice can lead to loving, reconciling, healing, including grace-enabling relationships across the barriers without which respectful intercultural citizenship is just an exercise in good intentions. And I'll just say here, I'm, I'm not very optimistic that the sort of disembodied progressive liberal version of multiculturalism actually has capacity to achieve these things. Uh, I think that's actually a God thing, which is why we're all here. So the following uh, represents or should represent perhaps practices of healthy Wesleyan congregations seeking to embrace the stranger in their culturally diverse communities. So first of all, this business of a Wesleyan way towards embracing the stranger. And the uh, first piece is a welcoming faith community. And this has already been identified. There is an ongoing conversation in Western pragmatic church planting circles, interestingly, of the value of specific ethno-linguistic congregations as the most appropriate response for immigrant newcomers, the homogeneous unit principle. There are cogent arguments, of course, for this approach, including the need for contextually appropriate worship or worship that fits the heart language and cultural framework of the newcomer, while recognizing the validity of distinct groups self-organizing as they see fit. Um, a Wesleyan worldview uh, should, would question the value of this model as a long-term response. So Dean Fleming uh, clarifies that the Wesleyan Catholic spirit is open to a truly trans-contextual hermeneutic, one that rejects all forms of provincialism and contextualism and seeks in humility to learn from the interpretive insights of Christians in other cultures to the end that we all come to a deeper and richer understanding of the faith. Authentic contextualization is far more than an academic exercise or a topic for scholarly debate. It is a missiological necessity for the whole church. That is, uh, a Wesleyan orientation to culturally diverse community would suggest that Christians from other cultural frameworks are invited, offered hospitality, welcomed into the Wesleyan congregation, wherever they might desire to fellowship. This in fact becomes a missional contextual response to a culturally diverse neighborhood. Rather than ghettoizing believers of other cultures, all are welcome in the Wesleyan congregation a powerful symbol of the transformative power of the Christian gospel that breaks down walls. Howard Snyder uh, said this, uh, this is where the salvation as healing motif leads if we walk in the spirit. This healing makes the church a sign and an agent of the larger, broader healing that God is bringing in Christ through the spirit. Then secondly, uh, the inclusive ministry of local churches. Just as there should be no debate about the inclusion of women in the leadership community of a Wesleyan-oriented congregation, there should likewise be no hesitation in including believers shaped by other cultural frameworks and value systems into the process of forming the values and identity of any congregation. Stuart Jordan um, urges us uh, to think that churches need to recognize their potentials as parables of inclusive community, as places of meeting beyond barriers of age, gender, race, culture, class. We need to become laboratories of the spirit since such congregations have unique opportunities to learn lessons about multicultural coexistence, which others need to hear. So in our increasingly diverse social context, it could be that Wesleyan-oriented congregations actually working at this business of becoming one new humanity may have something to say back to the community at large. 
To speak of ecclesia is to speak of a calling to be the people of God in public, a new and transnational nation gathered and assembled as a visible politics in and for the world. Wesley would say this is the best apologetic of the power of the Christian gospel. Thirdly, intercultural accountability. We have welcomed them, them, <laughs> into our congregations. We are including their insights into the shaping of our congregations. Will we now engage authentically as a family with all the good, the bad, and the ugly? And this is the heart of Wesleyan praxis, that seekers, the repentant, the maturing, must gather in small groupings to hold one another accountable for how the gospel is reshaping attitudes of mind and behavior that were commonplace when we were living with minds and habits conformed to the patterns of the world around us. So Wesley's social religion requires working out salvation in the context of authentic community. And this is best figured out in the context of close fellowship, interaction, with hearts prepared to hear what the spirit might be saying about my spiritual condition through the voice of my friend, the other. Uh, Howard Snyder, put it this way, if God can transform people into the likeness of Christ, he can build communities that transcend racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, cultural differences. Wesley's conviction that salvation is healing suggests potent possibilities for building reconciled and reconciling communities that are foretaste. Fourthly, we need to contribute to public conversation about difference. We've welcomed and included the other in our personal and our congregational lives. Will we now participate in public, expressing a Christian perspective on cultural differences in the public forum? Wesley and the Methodists were contributors to many conversations in the public sphere throughout the 18th century and beyond. Wesley was concerned for a reformation of manners throughout English society by which he meant many sorts of public behaviors and civil practices that he believed did not conform to a biblical worldview, including imprisoning debtors, oppressive child labor, prison conditions, sl slavery. Wesley was educated, well-read, and articulate to speak and write on many of the fairs of his day, which he did. Again, uh, Dean Fleming. One of the dynamics of Wesleyanism is its ability to adapt to new cultural, social, and intellectual climates in a way that some of the absolutist and systematically oriented traditions do not. Wesley's theology itself was a theology in process, not a static, finished product. Only when we subject Wesleyan theology to exegetical and biblical theological rigor and allow it to speak dynamically to ever-changing contexts do we remain genuinely true to Wesley and the theological tradition he spawned? So have we thought deeply about the challenges and concerns of our increasingly diverse communities? Can we express this concern through a Wesleyan paradigm? Are we able to express this at the table of public discourse in our communities? And finally, walk with the other. Perhaps it's this uh, practice which helps shape, of course, all of our responses above. Wesley takes us back to love for the genuine Christian. This same love is productive of all right actions. It leads him into an earnest and steady discharge of all social offices, of whatever is due to relations of every kind, to his friends, to his country, to any particular community whereof he's a member, it prevents his unwillingly hurting or grieving any man. It guides him into a uniform practice of justice and mercy, equally extensive with the principle whence it flows. It constrains him to do all possible good of every possible kind to all people. So we love in practical ways in the spirit of 1 John 3 because we were first loved by God. But then as we engage with the stranger, we note that this involvement is actually changing us, a means of God's unfolding grace in our lives. So, uh, just one final quote from Mo. So, love for others, born from experiencing God's unlimited love, creates the preconditions of social involvement. 
social sensitivity, solidarity and community, and compassion for others. Love awakens the conscience to unlimited responsibility for others, regardless of their religious, moral, or social character. So in this plain account of genuine Christianity, Wesley was certain that Christian life and community might be the single greatest apologetic for the power of the gospel continuum. Not a set of propositions, but the way a group of people live together with Jesus as their head. And it's Wesley's impulse to embrace the stranger and his notions of what is required to structure growth and discipleship that makes the crucial connection between theological formulations and the lived experience of Christian congregations. This Wesleyan interplay between the small accountability group where friendships across differences and intercultural dialogue can emerge around the word of God and the voice of the spirit and the larger public assembly where gathering at the Lord's table abolishes power and privilege constructed by a cultural difference. These are means of embracing the stranger and they may, may well be a unique contribution to the theology and practice of multi intercultural communities. And the life of such congregations is a powerful witness to the gospel in our struggling, socially diverse neighborhoods. Thank you.